Thanks for being my co-pilot on our first podcast. It's a great honor, Eric, to, you know, and the fact is this, there's an expression in recovery that says, generally, you know, if you really feel at home there, you will see I'm, I'm most comfortable at the center of the herd. And I feel that way about music creators as well. I feel that way about music I, from the moment that I picked up a little tiny guitar that I bought trying to teach myself to learn, you know, to, to learn enough chords to, to write my first songs. Even before I met other people, I felt that feeling that I was where I belonged. And uh, to the people that are listening that are ASCAP members and those that are not, I hope that, that what you get out of this is a, is a real sense of family. Because ASCAP is, you know, while it is this remarkably successful and, and effective organization that keeps us as members of ASCAP, you know, shiny side up as being able to, to have a life, feed our families and all those good things. The fact is that there is a sense of, of, of community that is just one of the healthiest, uh, most life-giving and really, really a sense of just belonging that, uh, that I cherish. And it's, you know, it's, it's as an ASCAP member first, as an American songwriter first, that one of the smartest things that ever happened to me was wandering over to ASCAP. Well, well, I've always enjoyed you waxing philosophical about the joys of creativity. I have a black belt in wax. <laughs> right. <laughs> that joy has brought you great success in your career and a wide and wonderful array of projects and experiences. Yeah. Um, today, I thought we could talk a little bit about those unexpected paths that your career can take yeah. and what other artists can do, other writers can do um, when something comes their way. Yeah, I think it's an interesting, there's a lot of information in what you just said when something comes your way, because we go out looking for the stuff, but so much, so much of my life that has been, you know, the most, uh, the most successful, the most uh, enjoyable, the, you know, are the, the big surprises, you know, and, and none of them in my case have, have been th things that are, are kind of, you know, down the, you know, d down the middle of this is if you do this you, uh, you, and, and you follow this particular path, you're going to be a monstrous success. Because every time I tried to follow that path and write, you know, and even try to write for that, you know, write down the center, nothing really happened. I've got a drawer at home full of great songs that were written trying to write, you know, you know what I thought was, was going to work. What has been most exciting ab about my work is that I've fallen in love with a variety of people along the way that, that create music and films and whatever. Mm -hmm. And I've had the chance to work with a lot of them. And they're very, very different, weird projects. I mean, you look at, at everything from, you know, from uh, Bugsy Malone or, or when the Carpenters uh, exploded on the scene, but basically, you know, the, I think when we've only just begun was number one the number one album in the country was I think in a Gata de Vida you couldn't get any further away from down the pike you right. know uh, and and it continued through other projects Bugsy Malone the Muppet you know working with the Muppets uh, right up to Daft Punk I think that that what what is most interesting is that the the greatest success and the and the most satisfaction in, in doing the work came from, from places that never really would, would qualify as this is the obvious choice, right. you know, to have a big career and, and a big life. Right. I mean, you mentioned We've Only Just Begun. You have a great story about how that song came into being. Want to share that with us? You know, it had all the romantic beginnings of a bank commercial. Yeah. I mean, it's just it's like... I wanna, Literally. You know, I, yeah. I want to be, you know... You know, I'm 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 street. I'm you know I'm Paul Williams. I'm street. I'm you know white light and black leather. I'm you know bad to the bone and everything. What do I write? What, what, what you know what really begins my career? It takes it to the place that that it eventually you know the a bank commercial. I was writing it for. I was a staff writer at A&M Records. I was an out of work actor who showed up at A&M Records. I, I was joking a stolen car. It wasn't actually stolen. I borrowed it from a friend. You know, but. But it's a great metaphor. I showed up with almost a, like a, you know, a, a, a failure as an actor. Actor, I, I couldn't make a living at it, uh, and started writing songs and and wound up at A and M Records. Luckily, a, a beautiful act of of, of uh, the universe. I stumbled into a, a career there. I showed up in a stolen car and I found a life and everything. And, and I was writing with a, a brilliant composer named Roger Nichols. Mm -hmm. They were looking for a lyricist for Roger Nichols when I showed up there. Nice timing, Vig Amigo. Um, so Roger and I were writing songs that were, that were getting 
a, you know, a lot of action, getting cut. Nothing was being played on the air. Mm -hmm. There were no singles. There were album cuts and B sides. Remember B sides? Oh, you know, the record on the back of, of a record that was that was selling. You still got paid. Right. Uh, but there's Roger, a, there's Nichols, a whole alternate universe of, of B sides. <laughs> yeah, the, I, I had you know, I had. B sides and album cuts. Almost everything Roger and I were writing was getting cut. And nothing was on the radio, but we were making a nice living as as writers. And all of a sudden, he gets a phone call from his buddy Tony Asher. And Tony Asher is a lyricist who wrote the lyrics to "God Only Knows," you know, mm. you know, with Brian Wilson. I mean, just an amazing lyricist. And Tony was supposed to write a commercial for a, a, an organization, a, a bank called Crocker Bank, and. Uh, and he had a skiing accident. He broke his hand. He broke the hand he writes with. He said he called Roger. He said I can't do it. I'm taking pain pills. I'm you know I'm a, I'm a mess. So I recommended you and Paul. And uh, Roger came to me and he said we've been recommended to write this commercial for Crocker Bank. And I'm like I don't want to write a commercial. I don't want to even write a commercial. You know, I'm a hippie. I've still got my love beads on. You know, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm wearing a black top hat, round black glasses. You know, tie dye T-shirt camouflage pants work boots you know and uh, and I'm, <laughs> and I'm it's at the heart of it is still this little sentimental you know you know Jiminy Cricket wannabe so the basically said look there's a creative fee I said oh well, that's great let's write this thing for the bank then and it was it was a commercial where they showed a young couple getting married they're driving off the kiss driving off into the sunset and at the end it just had copy that you know, it was printed You've got a long way to go. We'd like to help you get there to the Crocker Bank. That's all the information we had. And I basically, in an afternoon, sat down with Roger. He played a bit of music. I wrote, we know, we've only just begun to live. We have to cover the wedding. White lace and promises, they kiss. A kiss for luck, and we're on our way. Uh, and I sang it in the commercial. Richard Carpenter heard it. And Richard Carpenter was a fan, and Karen was mm -hmm. a, a fan of, of Roger and I. They, she, they were the only two people that ever walked in the door at a and that knew what we had written. Right. You know, and uh, it was so thrilling if somebody said, oh, I liked your cut with tr peppermint trolley or your whatever. And uh, so anyway, Richard Carpenter heard it, heard it on, on television, and he said, is there a full song? I said, yes, and, and bingo. I mean, it just, it was, it was... Uh, the beginning of, of them, it was the beginning of our career, right. really. What was the, the most immediate impact on the success of that song? Well, you know, I'd go to clubs, you know, with my publisher at the time, his name was Chuck Kay, and he'd drag, drag me along to, to a club, whatever, or some you know, rock and roll event or music event, and, and uh, I was sort of this little guy wandering around behind him, and he would then turn, at that point, he'd say, this is Paul, Paul Williams, he wrote the lyrics to We've Only Just Begun, and, uh, and I started getting some attention and it was like you know and I find that uh, for some of us that's highly addictive <laughs> so that's another part of my story and where that took me but but it was it was it was so important that I spent the years that I did with Roger Nichols because for somebody who never even knew that you know when I when I started writing I, you know and to this day I write in my head I hear the whole thing I'll go and go to the piano and find the chords is like looking for you know you know the buried treasure it's just you know it's it's you could if you could if you could write a script that matched what was going on in my, in my head looking for a d minor you know it sounds like, sounds like we're deep in the in the peruvian mountains and really what it's like it's a d minor and any idiot could find it in seven seconds and i still will look for it for an hour and all but but roger nichols was my my great friend immediately my writing partner but also he was he was my music school mm -hmm. he was my music this is the structure and what what was a gift to my life is that the great american songbook which is part of ascap's amazing catalog of brilliant music right the Great American Songbook was what I listened to. When I was in high school, I didn't listen to a lot of rock and roll. I discovered rock and roll through the Beatles years later. But I was in high school during the birth of rock and roll and all the, the, the mid-50s and didn't listen to it. I was listening to Gershwin. I, you know, my, my favorite writers were the Gershwins, you know, Rodgers and Hart, Rodgers and Hammerstein, uh, Johnny Burke, here's that rainy day, uh, uh, pennies from heaven. You know, I, you know, that's that's where my heart was, and that and that's what I responded to. You know, so meeting Roger Nichols was uh, was a, a great opportunity to 
to write in a in a very kind of a, a, a traditional fashion, right. you know, and uh, and it was it was just an amazing beginning. Well, and now you're part of that great American songbook yourself. Um, so while your music started making uh, connections with audiences, um, you know, no career is ever on an ever upward arc. You know, you have some ups and downs. Um, Let's talk a little bit about um, something that happened to you uh, in the mid '70s, um, where a work didn't connect with an audience. And I'm sp talking specifically about your uh, your film work with uh, Brian De Palma. Oh uh, well, Phantom of the Paradise. It, it's you know, it, you know, it's a slow burner, but it, it, it eventually it's almost hot now. It's it's right at the edge of hot. <laughs> it's, uh, I was a contract writer at A&M Records when Brian De Palma's uh, Brian De Palma came to 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 uh, to meet with a guy named Michael Arciega, who A and M had hired as a as a kind of a, a liaison to you know try to get you know more more A and M music into films. So Brian De Palma met with with Michael Arciega, and my name came up. Uh, at the time, I was beginning to do you know pretty regular. Uh, uh, I think the Tonight Show was probably the thing that it, that right. it made made Brian aware of me. Right. I, you know, because he, he had I was doing. I think I did forty eight Tonight Shows. I joke that I remember six, but <laughs> but by then I was doing the Tonight Shows. Uh, I was making albums, which were basically demos for other people to record the songs and all. But it was it, I was this kind of very middle of the road guy as far as you know. The, I'd had you know rainy days and Mondays, and and we've only just begun one last today with the Carpenters. Uh, I'd had by that time I'd had three hits with Three Dog Night, an old fashioned love song, uh, out in the country, uh, Family of Man. Uh, but Brian talked talk to me about about writing the songs first for Phantom of the Paradise. I was probably, I mean, based on anything you'd heard coming out of me before, I was the, probably the worst choice in the world to write. <laughs> I mean, why would you go to somebody, you know, that wrote that wrote uh, Let Me Be the One or wrote uh, Old Fashioned Love Song and write try to write the music of the spheres? And I think that Brian's connection to, to me may have been, and I've, just, I'll, I've never even asked him this. I should somebody, I suppose, suppose while there's still time. Yeah. Uh, but I think it was it was the humor. I think that that you know my my wife Mariana once said that it reminded me that she saw me on the Tonight Show and I described myself as a combination of Oscar Levant and Donny Osmond. And I think that <laughs> that that uh, that there was something about that 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 Brian responded to. And as I read the script, which I I mean I just I love the idea and. It seemed to me that that it, it was an opportunity to to satirize all the music I was falling in love with. Right, I right. Mean, the Beach Boys, you know, the the you know the 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 doo wop fifties, you know, uh, and it just it uh, it was a really good fit, you know. And I had by that time I had a great road band, and we just went in and played at doing these. I wrote the songs, we played with them, made made them sound, I think, pretty much like the acts we were we were we were satirizing. I think the that upholstery by the you know for the the Beach Boys, called the Beach Bums. <laughs> right, right. Uh, but there was a, a, another element that came into play that was really interesting. Is it, first of all, he watching me and and uh, my sense of, I don't know, a, a, a kind of a, a, a comfort in in a in a in a, in a place of control. You're trying to control what's going on to create the music. Yeah. He saw something that I think was kind of a Phil Spectorish. He said, "You right. could." His first thing he said was, "You know what? You got to play the Phantom. You got to. You could be up in the rafters throwing things down on people yeah. and all." I said, I, "That's ridiculous. I, I'm not scary. You know, I, you need scary." And then when he cast Bill Finley a, as the Phantom, and I, I watched his um, phenomenal work. He does more. He expresses more absolute, massive emotional in the subtlest fashion with only one eye showing through a helmet. That, that I just, it's just, it still stuns me to watch the level of, of, of his talent when I watch the film. But, but he also asked if I wanted to play Swan. Yeah. Swan's a great role. Swan's the devil. You know, he is, you know, he is the emissary of the devil. And uh, there's something about playing just pure evil with, with, with a certain amount of glee that was just great, <laughs> great fun. 
And the picture came out, and it, to, to quote, uh, I think it was Sam Goldwyn who talked about a f picture that was a failure. He said, people stayed away in droves. <laughs> they, they stayed away in droves of Phantom, and, you know. Uh, and basically, no, no, nobody went to see it, except there were two cities in this world that, that have had, a, a, especially one of them, that's mm -hmm. had a huge effect on my life. Yeah, in, in Winnipeg, you know, up in Canada in Winnipeg, Peggers loved the film. Mm -hmm. And the, the, a certain age level, and it played there for, it's still playing there. I mean, it's amazing. And the other place was, was Paris. And in Paris, it ran for forever, it seemed like, in one little theater. And uh, years later, I met two Frenchmen, you know, who, you know, who uh, met at, at a screening of, of Phantom. They went to the theater. They saw it 20 times together. Yeah. They asked if I'd work with them on an album. And of course, it was Daft Punk, you know. Wow. So, but here's the gift in, in in Phantom of the Paradise being a failure that I think, in a sense, helps me maintain a a, a mindset that is that is really constructive. Mm -hmm. Is that I maybe do my best. First of all, I think I do my best work when I'm lost, mm -hmm. and know as a gift. I didn't get the career that I wanted as an actor, mm -hmm. and I and I found songwriting, I found music. Uh, Phantom of the Paradise was not a success. Right. It was it was it was not an immediate success, but the love that the people that the people that loved it brought an energy to you know this this you know, they found a mission almost. You've got to see this movie, and amongst the people they would drag to see this movie that they'd never heard of. Why would anybody want me to go look at a nineteen seventy four musical? It right. was a failure, and out of that those people, a few more fanatics would be born. And so the people, the Peggers, the, the people of Winnipeg, created uh, this growing family of, of just where Phantom of the Paradise was almost a religion. And as time passed, these people became friends, not fans. Right. They became friends. And then they became family. And all of a sudden, I'm like, you know, it's, it's 45 years later. What is it, 1970? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, 45. It's 45 years later. And I'm experiencing, you know, this remarkable, uh, this this resurrection. You can't even call it a resurrection because it didn't. If it had, if it had been a mild success, even I don't think it would it would have the following it does today. Right. You know? um, and you had a fan in Guillermo del Toro as well, right? You know, in in Mexico City, uh, I think he was 16 years old at the time. This kid shows up at a concert that I did. Yeah, with a, a Phantom of the Paradise soundtrack <laughs> for me to sign. Yeah, and so it's like, it's a, and then years later I get a, a call, for, you know, to to talk to to Guillermo del Toro, who was that sixteen year old kid, uh, about a, a stage version of Pan's Labyrinth, which mm -hmm. I've you know written with with uh, Gustavo Santaolalla, brilliant ASCAP member, brilliant brilliant yes, composer, absolutely. Argentinian uh, genius. And uh, at this point, looking for, for a director. I mean, Guillermo is, is out there. At a certain point in my life, I, I realized that a, a, no is a gift. Don't get the thing you want, you get what you need, or mm -hmm. you have no idea what. And, and most of that really came from looking at my, my life and my world through sober eyes, you know. Yeah. I became better at showing off than showing up. I was getting a lot of attention for the songs I was writing that were successful. and. And the, the and all of a sudden, if you put down a, a camera and and a couch, Paulie Williams would plop into it like oh, he's <laughs> home at last. You know, hi, here's America's sweetheart. Let's get to know each other. And the fact is that uh, while this was happening, my addiction to to alcohol and cocaine was growing. Right. And eventually, my addiction to alcohol and cocaine outran my addiction to to attention, to you know, to be, to to be America's sweetheart. And right. instead of sitting in front of the camera. You know, I had I had a, a beautiful home up in Santa Barbara, and I had an office I never left in that in that that house. And and I was watching my wife and my kids, and my kids being raised by their their mother and their aunt and nanny. Right. You know, uh, and in 1989, I had my last drink. And March 15th, I celebrate. You know, my my continuous sobriety. Uh, and it's been the most amazing 29 years of my life. And one of the things that, that I, I began to notice is that, that uh, 
first of all, that sense of belonging. I mean, that absolute sense of, you know, I, you know, and it began with me doing something I hadn't really done before. And right. that's, you know, if, if, you know, turning to people, strangers, and saying, I don't know how to, how to get out of this. Right. I don't know what I'm doing, and I desperately need help. Will you help me? And people came out of the woodwork. That's great. That, that community was monstrously uh, uh, devoted you know, to you know, the, the you know, we get to keep the miracle by giving it away. That's right. how I stay sober is is by talking about recovery and and there was an interesting moment, incidentally, for me as in in two thousand nine. I was, you know, I I joined the ASCAP board in two thousand one. In two thousand seven, I I became writer co chair. Right. Uh, and in two thousand nine, I was elected president and chairman of the, of the board and. At the time, the the CEO was was a man named John Lofermeno. And John, you know, said, you know, this is, and Hal David was a big part of that too. Hal was a mentor and a great friend. And Hal said, you know, this is, I think you're absolutely the guy to do this, you know. And I said, you know, I ran for the ASCAP board. When when they asked me to run for the board, Hal Hal said, I want you to run for the board. Mm -hmm. I said, I ran for the board in the 80s, didn't get elected. And he said, yes, and the world's a safer place because then you were not ready to to do it. But you're sober now. I was like 11 years sober at the time. When I joined the board, and I had a conversation with John Lofermeno, and I said, I can't do this if I have to not talk about what saved my life. Right. There are two things I'm intensely passionate about. Obviously, recovery, because it gave right. me the, my life back. And the other thing is, is music creators' rights. Right. And it's, you know, if I'm given the freedom from drugs and freedom from my own addiction, you know, to live a complete life, you know, and, and to participate as a co-creator what, in the life that I want, what is the, what better thing for me to then to look at than the, uh, than, than the chance to, to really protect other people's right to, to, to create, you know, what is most important to them, to create their art. So it's, it's, a, it's an obsession and an honor, and it's, and it's the most fun I've ever had. Well, you've done an amazing job in the 10 years you've been in this role, Paul, so hopefully you keep up the great work. I uh, love um, it. You know. you know, there seems to be a, a character among, a character trait among a lot of artistic people where they, they, they try to control, you know, they try to, like, shape their their image or their their path to such a degree i mean someone would call them control freaks but um you can't always control that what what would you say to those people that try to control every detail and outcome i tell them about my brother yeah you know uh my little brother mentor ralph williams (laughs) mentor williams uh an amazing sweet sweet man that uh, that that wanted to be a songwriter like his brother Mm -hmm. Uh, he was born six years after I was. Uh, we were pretty much separated through my high school years and everything. Uh, uh, I, had, I mean, that's a separate story. My dad died. I was shipped off to live with an aunt and uncle. But Menor and I became close through the years. Uh, he was my little big, my big little brother. I was his little big brother and all. And when he was a little kid, I remember when I would sing for the neighbors, my dad would have me sing for the neighbors. Uh, after the neighbors applauded, <laughs> you'd hear this. Rudolph the red nose reindeer had a very shiny nose and behind a door, you know. And it'd be my little brother, like, you know, when I'm like 12 and he's like, or I'm like, you know, nine, he's like three, four years old, whatever. Right. And uh, hold on, I'll be back. With, I'll do the math and be back in about 20 minutes. Uh, but he always loved music. He always wanted to make music. And I, I, I was having a pretty successful life in the early 70s at, at A&M. And he came out to uh, to california and we we uh we got him a six-month deal at a&m records mm-hmm. as a staff writer office just down the hall from me <laughs> you know the williams brothers are there and he did what you were talking about he had you know he said i'm gonna i'm gonna write if i'm gonna find that that path right down the center i'm gonna he's listen to what's what's happening and i show that i can do it too and, and nothing nothing worked i mean he wrote some wonderful, wonderful stuff that just didn't click. Right. And people wouldn't listen. You know, in those days, you had vinyl dubs, and you know, nobody listened to, uh, to the whole song. Right. And he just so all of a sudden, it's a Saturday before he has to clean. The six months are up. It's a, it's a Saturday. It's pouring rain at A and M Records, which incidentally is the old Chaplin movie studio. It's yeah. it's a lot with this, with sound stages and offices and all. So there's nobody on the lot. 
it's the guard at the gate and men are sitting in his office all by himself looking at the, the stuff that he has to get out of there by Monday because he's being tossed out, mm-hmm. didn't work. And he's totally confused. I mean, he's like, he's done his absolute best to, you know, to, to use his gift and write and, he, and it, nothing's working and he doesn't understand it. He's totally confused. And he grabs a, a pad of paper, a yellow lined pad of paper and a pencil. And he writes down, day after day, I'm more confused. And it's pouring rain out. So yet I look for the light and the pouring rain. He looks around the office, and he's got to get all this stuff out. You know, that's a game I hate to lose. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm counting on you to carry me through. He was a deeply religious man, and then he wrote it. He said it poured out of him. Give me the beat, boys, and free my soul. I want to get lost in your rock and roll and drift away. Uh, And it's an anthem. Yeah. And, And his contract was picked up, of course. I lost my brother two years ago, and, uh, he, you know, he'd been sober 12 years when he passed away. Uh, he, he and I shared sobriety for, for, for those last, last amazing years of, of, of his life and really found each other. Mm-hmm. I mean, really, really began to hear each other. But the lesson with my brother and the lesson for me and I think the lesson for all of us, and I love telling that story, is by understanding that in the center of your chest what you're feeling is a gift for the rest of the world Mm -hmm. if you can share that what you give anyone who hears it and is the least bit open to it you give them the opportunity to go oh my god i feel that too that's me too and and in a way and it's what a great song does yeah is it tells you you're not alone right you know because Uh, The things that make me cry that I'm willing to put down. I mean, even when I look like an absolute wimp, you know, if I write a song that most people don't know called That's Enough For Me, that's all the hero I need to be. I smile to think of you and me and how our pleasure makes you cry or how our pleasure makes me cry is something that most men, you know, real men don't talk about, about uh, how they cry, you know, when, you know, when they're, when they're making love or whatever. But if I'm willing to share that, so, and somebody else hears it, uh, I have I've offered a connectedness that is, yeah, all of a sudden I'm hearing REMs, you know, you know that's me in the corner, that, that, that's my religion, you know. Right. Well, there's, there's such tremendous value in that gift of writing something that connects with other people. Yeah. And I think you do a great job of, of uh, urging younger songwriters today to, yeah. to understand and believe in the value of that thing that you're creating because yeah. th- there's it's it's really it's really an incredible and the, value. one of the one of the most important messages we we have I think Eric to share is that you know that there's so many surprises in my in my my career things that, that the time that they were created that that just just didn't have that that immediate you know, success or, or that that Somehow, I don't think that I always saw the real value in what what I was creating. But the smart thing, there wasn't really the option at the time, but is I didn't give it away. One of the things we're facing right now in the industry, and and it's and it's, I think it's it it could be devastating, is the idea of buyouts. The idea of you know right if you know I, Charlie Fox and I wrote a wrote a title song for a for a, a television series in. in that was that we looked at each other and went, "What are we doing?" With I, you know, with my great ability to spot a success, I didn't think this show would last five episodes, mm-hmm. and it was the Love Boat. Yeah. And so Charlie and I wrote the Love Boat theme, and it ran first run for it's playing somewhere right now. Oh, sure, it is. And it ran first first run eleven years and all. And if I had, if somebody had turned to me and said, "We'll give you ten times." your normal creative fee, you know, and I've got, I've got, you know, a car in the, in the garage that, you know, that I, that I have payments on every month and mm-hmm. I need to put food on the table. It's really easy to say, you know what, right now, that's kind of what I'm, I'm going to do. And, and by doing that, what you do is you, you create, you know, you create, put yourself in a situation where anybody that comes to you to hire you after that will take a quick look at, at your history and say, okay, I want the same deal. And all of a sudden, you know, all of a sudden you're denying yourself, you know, what, what can be, um, you know, uh, a future, right. a career, uh, uh, a, a, 
economic connectedness to the thing that you do that is your spirit, that is a holy thing. You're, you're saying to the universe, uh, you gave me this, but I don't trust that there's any real future in it. I'll take what a, you know, a bird in the hand. The fact is, it's like, you know, it's like eating the golden goose sometimes. Don't eat the golden goose. Don't do that. Trust that what you have, the world is going gonna, is gonna to connect with and is going gonna, is gonna to thrive and, and be an amazing gift to you and your family in the future. Mm-hmm. Don't sell your future. Right. Um, another big uh, theme to your story is, is uh, community, whether it's the music community or the recovery community um, and collaboration, um, because it's important to remem- remember that music creators are not alone. No, and not. that And that, uh, you know, reaching out and making connections with other people yeah. is probably the smartest thing you can do. Find your tribe. And, you know, if you want to relate that to, to our careers, find, find your tribe. You know, like my tribe is ASCAP. I mean, I, I mean trust me, I, I mean, I've written, you know, with BMI writers, but, you know, it's, you know, it's, but my tribe is ASCAP. Mm-hmm. ASCAP has... has cared for me and my family, you know, since 1972. Yeah. It's a long commitment. You mm-hmm. know, uh, that's a lot of comfort. That's a lot of safety. That's a lot of, that's a lot of future that, that, that show my making that choice to, to walk over to ASCAP, you know, uh, has delivered. Mm-hmm. That should be a choice that songwriters should always have. Songwriters should always, you know, win. Cause if, you know, if you're, if you're, and you know whatever whatever genre you're writing at, incidentally, the, with all the hybrid activities of, of genres running into each other, right. I I don't think it's ever been more exciting to make music. But you know, at the same token, when ASCAP had a, a history, uh, had a, a a value, and it, I mean, it, it feels like America's performing rights organization. It's just, it was the place where where I I felt absolutely. I felt my I felt the 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 honor of being a songwriter mm-hmm. when I saw you know when I saw that the, that little ASCAP symbol right uh, next to my name on a record and and it turned out to be the uh, the smartest thing that I could have done at that point you know uh, business wise as well and I think that's something that we really have to you know and 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 I'm talking about a record I'm I'm not talking about something that that is, is that is ASCAP's you know, ability to say we are going to, you know, we, we want to, we we want to demand this. With this is as a songwriter, as a member of ASCAP, uh, as much as anything, as a songwriter, who is grateful for being able to have that choice. Uh, I urge every songwriter listening to, you know, to whichever PRO you choose, that should, in my opinion, that's your right. Mm-hmm. You know, so. Go, you know, you know, you know. I I get up in the morning and I say to the big amigo, "Lead me where you need me," you know. So, and I listen and I follow the, the, the my own instincts on that, and and where I'm led uh, has always, always been been uh, the right choice for me. So, guard that right, guard that right, and I don't think that anybody listening that that is passionate about their their writing, their composing, or you know. Or if they're in the business side, if, they're, if you're a publisher, mm-hmm. if you love music and you want to find great young writers and give them a chance to be heard, for anybody you know that is that is that is in love with with uh, with uh, with what we do, uh, be passionate, be vigilant, and and become an activist. You know, we spend a lot of time in, in Washington D.C. Uh, I spent uh, with uh, with everybody. You know, it, it was amazing the, the the turnout of of writers and publishers and and music creators. You know that that poured into D.C. trying to change the rules that we operate under. And what eventually became the Music Modernization Act. It was a, a, a it was an act of of, of passionate. Passionate devotion uh, and uh, and a, a an entire industry in some ways, but especially I think especially songwriters are so effective when you go to Washington and, and you walk into a senator's office and they go, "Oh my God, you're lie, I love it." I go, "No, I'm Paul Williams, but no, but I mean, you walk in with with Lyle love it and the and the senator and his staff and they're all of a sudden you know pouring out of their offices into the halls as you walk by." 
And they love Lyle Lovett's music, and Lyle Lovett turns to them and says, you know what, you can help us here. So to your audience, you know, if you're, if you're just starting this journey, or if you've been doing it a long time, uh, you are needed. Yeah. You are needed, and you know, you know, and let that fire in the center of your chest, you know, uh, warm the hearts of the people on the hill. You'll make a difference. Um, well, um, ASCAP's advocacy work um, has gi- has been given a great boost and a platform at our annual event in LA, the Music Creator Conference, um, formerly called the ASCAP by Create Music Expo. We've renamed and uh, reimagined it, and it's now called the ASCAP Experience. Um, but uh, it's more than just a music conference. It's, 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 it's music school, it's a live music festival, it's a, a, a real life social network. It's, it's the high school quad experience that, that I never had until ASCAP Expo and now ASC, ASCAP Experience. Because, you know, high school for me was, you know, was getting dunked in the pool and stuffed into a locker. Uh, that, but, to, you know, to... Uh, if I had been, you know, that, that you know, whether a football hero or, or you know, or a third string, you know, backup uh, punter <laughs> or whatever, the, there was something about the way that I've, I've heard so many people discuss their, their high school experiences that is exactly what ASCAP Expo forward slash experience, that is exactly what the ASCAP experience feels like to me, mm-hmm. to be surrounded by people that are, that are, you know, on fire with the love of making music is uh, is a unique experience. To have the chance to sit down and listen to 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 Ludacris uh, interviewing Quincy Jones, or for me to sit down with Questlove. I mean, you would think, okay, Paul Williams and Questlove, two peas in a pod. Not ex- <laughs> not exactly, but oh my God, you know what a, a remarkable talent, and what an expanding creative experience he's having. You know, from the books, you know, to you know, to the, his his leadership, you know, in in uh, almost everything he he touches, and it, there, there's so much to be learned from just. I mean, Google Google the man. You know, to take a look at some of the things he's done. I mean, most of the people listening, I'm sure, are aware of it. But, but it's the it's the the, the breadth of those experiences at the at the ASCAP experience, you know, that will that will be a, 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 a quote unquote experience that will that will that will fuel your journey. I can promise you that. I think we did it, Paul. Thanks for sharing your sage wisdom with us today, and thanks for being such a great advocate for music creators. I know how hard you work. You know, I talked about sitting down with my brother and I, the kind of relationship that, that my brother and I had. It's the kind of relationship that, that, that you and I have, Eric, at this point. We spend so much time together, and you know, so, so many of the things that I'm able to, to share that I so passionately believe in many, many times, that, you know, the, the real focus comes from our friendship and the ability to have this shared experience. So I hope that, that everybody, as, as the podcast you know, uh, continues on and other, other people, have the chance to to do what I just did I, I think that that it's important to realize that that your host you know er, Eric Philbrook is somebody that that brings so much to the table and uh, and has great passion for 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 what we all get to do and he's uh, he's one of us and and uh, I'm grateful for our for our collaborative experiences and our friendship well thank you Paul it's an honor to walk this path with you yeah me too 